I experienced mm. something similar when DJing, when EDM became a thing 10 years ago and DJing became bigger than it ever was. Yeah. Both of those things make me, the, lead me to a very simple thought, which is be careful what you wish for. You need the Kellervision app. 24 7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top fives, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Beatbox created. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Cat podcast. Um, big shout out to graffitikings.co.uk. Yes, people, Killer Cat, live and direct on the podcast. Once again, we are inside with an OG inside the place. Hey, thank me later because this one is so legit. This one's so legit. A friend of mine, he goes by the name of A Track. How are you, my brother? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm trying to work out how, when was the last time we actually were in the same room talking to each other. I um, I don't think I know the answer to that. <laughs> yeah, I I think we were young and green at the time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes, because <laughs> we used to cross paths a lot twenty years ago. Yeah, and yeah, I'm sure and, and, I've seen you since, but it, it might have been ten years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like in yeah. passing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like kind of in passing in those. South by Southwest, uh, hard fests that we really yeah. should be, yeah. <laughs> so that, that's, yeah, man, still many years ago. Yeah, a long time ago. Where about you at the moment, my brother? I'm in Los Angeles right now. LA, nice. Mm-hmm. Right, nice. Yeah. We just thought you were, I mean, obviously Montreal being your first home. I always, yeah. I just always automatically associated you, you know, as a New Yorkian. Yeah. I still associate myself as a New Yorker, but uh, I have a I have a house in in LA that I got about five years ago, and um, um, for the last couple of years, I've been splitting my time between New York and, and LA. And, and this year, when I had to pick a place to go and spend uh, lockdown, it was just yeah. um, it just felt like you know the 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 living space was better in LA. Yeah, for sure. For sure, can do you do you feel the difference? You know, from a from an American point of view, being Canadian, do you feel the you being different from West to East Coast from a musical point of view? Um, musically, not that. I mean, musically, the only place I would I would the only sort of part of the scene where I, I I'll say a, I'll notice the difference is like. Um, when it comes to the, sort of the underground scenes of each city and like the emerging talent and, and kind of where new uh, rappers and DJs and MCs hang out, it's different. And, you know, through my work with Fool's Gold, I try to stay pretty tapped in with those parts of the scenes. You know, like a, part of my life is me talking to people from my age group, <laughs> you know, and another part of my life is just kind of keeping up with, with new talent a lot. Sure. Um, it also on that level, it's different, but um, beyond that, you know, it's just with the way things are with the internet and everything, you know, you kind of see the, see and hear the same music in most places now. Um, yeah, I feel that. I think the cities themselves have a different vibe and, and energy and drive, like drastically different. Living in LA and living in New York, it's, it's really, really, really different experiences. Um, yeah. But to your question about specifically music for them, you know, I think um, you got to, like a lot of New Yorkers have moved to LA over the last 10 years and, and vice versa. So it's like, it's not as clear cut as it once was. Yeah. It feels like, I mean, maybe LA and New York are going through the same uh, gentrified experience. I, I would imagine that takes a lot of toll because you're, 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 you're very fundamental in the, the discovery of new acts and, you know, with Fool's Gold, Gold being the record label, you're essentially a and r So it's like, yeah. you go to them places, it's, you, them, there must be, them, it must feel like there is a, a different kind of energy to the people that are living in LA and New York because it's, it's fucking hard to live out in them places now. Yeah. Um, you know, New York is an extremely expensive 
place to live in. Um, you know, comparable to London, though. Uh, and Is and it? yeah, yeah. And I think it has a similar effect to up and coming artists of all kinds, where it just kicks it kicks people in the ass, and it makes people feel like they have to somehow fight or you flight. know make it and yeah and figure it out. And that drive stays with you. LA is a much more comfortable city fundamentally. So, you know, there's a little bit less of that hustle in LA, uh, but there's a lot of infrastructure in LA and there's a ton of studios and, yeah. you know, songwriters and things like that. So it's just a kind of a different um, balance and structure. I thought your original question, I thought you were going to ask me if I still, as a Canadian, if I still feel differences in America in general. Because Do the you answer to that is, yeah, yes. go for it. I you mean, do. Oh, yeah, for sure. And I mean, you know, even in, in recent times with the election in, in the U.S., uh, it, it's, it's brought a lot of things to the surface. Um, but, you know, grew up, I grew up in Montreal. I, I, I left in 2006. I moved to New York in 2006. So it's been a while. It's been 14 years. Yeah, and I still, years. yeah, I've been living in the U.S. for 14 years and I still don't feel like I'm from here. You know, New York is kind of my adult hometown, and there's a lot of things about New York that I um, take to heart and identify with. But as far as the USA in general, it's like I have to remind myself of certain things constantly just to understand. Like, there's, I'll have like sort of cognitive blocks where I'll be like, why is this like this? And then I have to stop and think, like, oh, yeah. Well, America was built on these ideas, and I grew up in a country that was built on different ideas. The yeah. U.S. and Canada are so close, and there's so many exchanges between the two countries. You know, you sort of assume that that it's you know peas in a pod, but it's not. It's really different. Yeah, that's for sure. And and, and yeah, you you must go through those moments of just uh, at times this confusion and despair of some of the simplest things that are just, mm -hmm. they work in a whole different way over there. Where, I guess it's, you, you have, for those times where it's, it's most hardest, you must take peace of mind that you have a home in Montreal and that this is, this is not your mind going crazy at times. This is just, a, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if, you know, if things just get worse and worse here, sure, I could just go back to where I grew up and my parents are still there and I have family in Montreal yeah. and the, there is kind of a, a nest there, you know? Yeah, um, yeah, I yeah. try not to get in that mindset too much because I I, I prefer to commit, you know? And, yeah. and um, so even when Trump was elected four years ago, you know, a lot of people were saying- Pack up uh, and go. Yeah, like, yeah. are you gonna go back to Canada? And-, and uh, I was almost offended by that sometimes because I would just say like, no, my, I've been in America for, at that point I'd been there for 10 years. Mm. Um, I would feel like I'd be abandoning a lot of my friends and, and a place that greeted me in a sense, I would feel yeah. kind of like an ingrate to, to leave and, and leave when times get hard. You know, I just kind of felt like, no, this is where I planted my, new roots um since 2006 so mm. i'll just tough it out with my friends and, and things will get better um mm. you know i know people who had just recently moved to america who left when when trump was first elected four years ago that i understand but yeah when you're there, when you're somewhere for, for 10 plus years you know it, you kind of just see it as as uh, where you live yeah yeah and it's it's connected you're, you're so connected to, to the, the community of it all i, I get yeah. you because i was exactly the same with lockdown you know my family home is like in the south of england and uh -huh. and that was people you know you know batting down your doors lock, you know lock all your ob objects you know where you stay in or go where you come back and where you come from and for me i was like nah man i'm you know i'm a londoner you know you yeah you don't do i don't you know i just don't know how i get down you know what i mean yeah, yeah, exactly. Sure. I think um, this year, with all the all the challenges and strife and everything between COVID itself and um, and you know, then in America um, over, over the summer, the Black Lives Matter movement, like a lot mm -hmm. of the social unrest around that, um, for better or for worse, and in some cases for worse, I think we've gotten to see a lot of people's true colors. You, you sure. see a lot of, you know what I mean? Like you see a lot yeah. of 
someone's character shines through when things are not going well. Yeah, you right. Know? And, and I think like... in our industry, in, in music, there's a lot of people that we just sort of casually see around for years and years. And it can get to a point where everyone kind of feels like a friend. Um, yeah. But some people are just acquaintances. And I think, you know, when, mm. yeah, when times are hard and, and, and you see where, where people's values are and who has a spirit of solidarity versus yes. who doesn't, you know, I, it's been one of those years where, you know, certain friendships had to get cut off too. And, and I think that's fine. I, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. maybe that was needed. It's, a, it's somewhat of a cleansing, isn't it? You know? Um, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. It's interesting you say that. I think, I think with a lot, a lot of this. Now, I know this may sound a little bit, uh, you know, idealistic, but you were, uh, your community is it, it derives from a, a hip hop background yes. and a hip hop yes. mentality. Yeah. Um, I, I've seen recently, and again, I think this is elements of fight or flight because I certainly felt like in this in this time, it's almost like shit will get off the pot. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, let's mm-hmm. go. And doing more in the time where you have the opportunity to, it's not easy for everybody, but, you know, you do see other people just fall off as you're just like fighting, fighting, fighting. Go through. I've noticed in, in your, uh, particularly on your Instagram, I've noticed a lot more proactive A-track. You know what I mean? Like a lot more DJ related stuff, a lot more hip hop related stuff. And I, I felt, I felt to me personally, I felt, yeah, that's dope. Cause like you're, you're kind of, you're going back to a roots, if you want, of, of community, that, that value, the value of, of yeah. the music that you've, you, yeah. you've come from. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I think, um, you know, time stopped this year. Right. Yeah. So, you know, for many, many years, the, the, the whole, um, the machine of being a a touring DJ and label owner and all these things, you know, for many years, that was just kind of churning to a point where it was almost automatic, you know, and there was a lot of, there was constant touring and, you know, I think even certain, um, you know, decisions and activities that were done sometimes without even questioning. It was just like, go, go, go constantly. Yeah. And, and maybe for certain periods of time, I, I, you know, maybe I wouldn't um, stop and talk about certain uh, causes and values that are important to me because I, I would just be running from one city to another and, you know, promoting a record or whatever. So it's not that mm. those things weren't part of my life, but they, they, weren't, they weren't as much in the day to day. This year when time stopped and the show stopped and um, all that was left was you know, trying to save a sense of community. Yeah. Um, you're right. I did, I did go back to um, some of the fundamentals of, you know, even just sort of like where this whole DJing adventure started for me or when, what are mm. the things that I care about? Um, and not, you know, not to, not to, uh, not to toot my own horn or say that, 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 uh, you know, what I've, what I've done this year is, is, is perfect. I don't, I don't think it is by any, by any means, but it's true that it's, I've, I've gone back to thinking a lot about what's, what's this, what's the part of the scene, what's the subculture and the mentality mm-hmm. and the values that made me fall in love with music, you know, 25 years ago. And what's the current version of that and what are ways to, you know, get even more involved and active. And a lot of it is very grassroots and organic and it's, even if I'm, it's, you know, most of the music I put out now is, is house music, uh, but I'm hip hop minded, you know, yeah. and, and, um, you know, what I have in my core. Um, yeah. yeah, what's in your soul, what you, you grew up on the mentality. Yeah, yeah, and, and, um, it's very much of a community thing and it's a very much of a, you know, all these expressions like each one teach one, right? Like that you, yeah. you hear that in records growing up and it's like, those are things I believe in. Um, so it's, and, you know, sort of hand in hand with that, even musically, um, a lot of the music that I've been making this past year 
yeah. has gone back to even a little bit like even more on the organic and soulful soulful mm-hmm. side of things because that's just kind of where my head is at and those are the the sort of textures that match the emotions that I'm feeling you know that's right um so but you know it's it's I think a lot of that was starting to happen anyways. Like last year at Fool's Gold Day Off, I did, I did a performance with Black Thought from The Roots. Oh, that's just so me and him just on stage, half an hour, yeah. uh, me playing any beat that, like me pretty much throwing him through an obstacle course, <laughs> throwing so any sick. beat of him rapping. Um, the Roots are one of the bands that made me get into music, you know, in like 94, 95. When Do You Want More came out in 94, I think. Like that's, yeah. Literally when I dipped my toes in this whole thing. So, you know, certain things like that um, have gone full circle for me. And, and it's, it's interesting to, um, it's interesting to um, figure out ways to do this whole full circle thing in a way that's not only retro, you know. Yeah. In a way that still feels like it's moving forward. So now I'm, I'm I, one of the projects I've been working on uh, this year is something with my brother, where we have we we're making records under the name The Brothers Makovich. People oh, know my sorry, brother, sorry. yeah, and people know that my brother's in Chromio. People know my music, but they, you know, this is the first time that we give them songs that we make together. And we went and got remixes from people like DJ Spinner who we've been listening to literally since we started making music in, in the oh, 90s. Geez. Yeah, oh, working with Spinna, working with um, Pal Joey and like Morgan Geist from Metro Area, all these classic musicians mm. who shaped our ear way back in the day, but we're, you know, updating the sound. And there's a lot of things like that that I've been doing. Even, um, you know, three years ago, I started Goldie Awards, the DJ battle that I, that I organized. Yeah, we're going to get into that. I want to talk about some of that as well. Cool. Yeah. And so a lot of that, I feel like there's been kind of this path for me where you, you, you met me in the sort of chapter one of my music career when I was just doing battles, right? Yeah. And then battles kind of dried up for a while. And then I went and, and uh, eventually met Kanye and did work with him. Then I started Fool's Gold and started producing electronic music and did that for a while. And through Fool's Gold, you know, also uh, learned how to organize things more and like mm. put on my own festivals in the States and, and run a store and all that kind of stuff. Like just like learn the business. Yeah, just, just things that I didn't think... You, no, thank you. But, and it's things I didn't think I'd be doing when I was 16, you know, but it taught me, um, I, or I kind of taught myself with my friends, we taught ourselves the business and, and how to do things on a bigger scale. And in the last few years, there's been a pattern of a few things that happened where I've been able to go back to certain things that were part of the very beginning of my career, like battles, and say, okay, how can I take all these tools and skill sets and resources and relationships that I built up in the last 10, 15 years, you know, as I was expanding into larger spaces, how can I apply that to the the thing that I first started with? And like, can we update battles? Can we update this and that? And, And that's, that's been kind of my, you know, my passion for the last few years is trying to go full circle but in the way that's forward. So, you know, Goldie Awards, it it was a bit of a landmark moment whereby it was almost like you were coming back into your own zone and it felt like everything that you had done up till then, like you were saying, the, the, the collection of uh, a phone book, it's only as valuable as the thing you're doing. Right. And I guess you're at this point where you've done, you know, you became the face of many uh, EDM photo shoots and live shows Mm -hmm. and festivals. Mm -hmm. And, and I guess you can, strike a bit of a opportunity while it's there and make use of that status and throw it back into the community and it was almost like with open arms man i think you took it to another level you took it to the sampling the production the you know the whole thing had its own it was completely out of the box compared to all the other you know battles and tournaments that were going on thanks man yeah i think Look, not 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 to not to bad not anyone or any organization, but I think some of the other battles stayed a little bit stuck in an older format. And you know, 
I'm traveling around, meeting all kinds of different DJs and producers and seeing things progress very fast. And even just on, a, on an equipment level, on a technological level, mm. people are using all types of gear now. And, sure. you know, if you tell people that they can only use 1200s and 1200s aren't even manufactured anymore, it's you're kind of saying, a, yeah, it's a problem. <laughs> so I'd rather say you can use 1200s or you can show up here with a little controller that's, you know, the size of your hand. Impress us. If you can yeah. beat, if you can show up in a little USB controller and beat someone who's using 1200s, that's a conversation right there. Like, let's yeah, try for it. Sure. You for know, sure. so there's that. And, and um, um, yeah, even just on a sort of event production level, you know, being that we were fresh and new as, you know, as an organization, I think we were able to just take a fresh look at everything. There's mm-hmm. no baggage of, you know, it's not as if we're in a situation where we've been dealing with the same production company or, or you know, uh, rentals companies, all this kind of yeah. stuff for years and years. We could just come in with fresh eyes and ears and, and you know, if anything, just use a lot of the information of putting on other kinds of festivals and think, yeah. okay, what's the best way to throw a DJ battle and a beat battle? And mm-hmm. we tried to do it in a way that was as, you know, pro and and sort of uh, high tech as possible. And the thing that I love that, that is that the DJs who have participated in the Goldie Awards in the last, you know, we've done this for three years now. I think, I mean, many of them have told me that it, it felt validating for them to show up on a nice. stage that had yeah. that level of production and that level of ef- efficiency with stage managers and, and that mm. kind of stuff that, you know, it's like, it makes them feel valued and important. And that's what I want. Yeah, that's fire. Also your, your credentials. I mean, let's get, let's get into the, the nuts and bolts of that. Like 97 DMC champ. You, mm-hmm. you were, you were at one time you were Vestax ITF and DMC champion all at once. Yeah. You know, you, I remember the first time I heard you cut on a record was the Obscure Dif- Disorder tune uh, with Bill. Bill. Yeah, I mean, yeah, with you, yeah, with yeah, yeah, 2004. I urge anybody that if you ain't checked that shit out, that, oh my God. Like, Thanks, I mean, you just, I'll just fast forward it to the cuts to be. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, it was just when you started cut, cutting up that non fiction, it was just like, oh, he mm. don't give a fuck. You know what I mean? You're just on. Mm. Um, and that was the attitude. And then, yeah, I mean, how, like 15 years old and you were you were in the mix like that. I mean, it's, that's some sort of, you know, meant to be, you were meant to be a DJ. You know what I mean? I guess so. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think, um, it's interesting. I, I think about that more and more over the years, not even just for myself, but as I, as I have conversations with other people who are getting into music too. And, you know, I think, um, <clears throat> In the first couple of years of my career, everything was happening very fast. So there's a lot of things that I didn't even second guess. And there's a lot of things that I didn't even ask myself whether this is normal or not. Which you, <laughs> you do. Know? As a kid, yeah. that's what you do, right? You just do. You just go and yeah. have fun and you try your best. And that's all I did was I just would go work hard, try my best, but also enjoy myself. And some of it was stressful, sure. And, and some of it was tiring and I was in high school at the same time as I was traveling for DJing but at the end of the day uh there's a there's an aspect of what I was doing at, in those years when I was 15 16 17 mm. 18 whatever that in hindsight was out of the ordinary <laughs> and I sure. and that and I understood that on paper and every article written about me would say that I thought I got it but i think i only understood that much later on <laughs> where to me i was just like yeah like, i know i'm I'm young and there's never been a dmc champion who's my age i get it but later on i was like but that was even weirder than i realized <laughs> but you know but, what also was weirder you know what also was weird right is that? having no, knowing you at that time yeah it just felt like you were all about better you were all about craft you were all there wasn't an ego moment it's weird because you know kids mm. You know, that kind of stereotypical, what you would presume kids would be like, you weren't worried about that at all. And it just made it, you made it, you yeah. made it look inspiring for younger people to do it too. That was the Thanks, thing. man. And, and, and that aspect, uh, 
stuck with me for a while. And, and so again, even that, I didn't think that I was doing anything that special, to be honest. And I'm not mm-hmm. saying that with false modesty. And, you know, I realized that I was, I had certain achievements. I knew that I was the first to win, you know, this battle combined with that battle and whatever else. But there, there's definitely something that came, that came out of that, that made a lot of other people see me and tell themselves I could do that too. Mm. And for a long time, I wasn't sure what it was about that. And I'm still not sure if I'm the best person to explain what it was, but that's, it's funny. I I did an interview the other day when someone asked me, what's, what am I proudest of? And I think it's just that, just the impact of making other people have this sort of assurance or confidence to just, go for it themselves too and try to try it out. And then, you know, when I meet certain people, even now who tell me, Hey, 23 or 22 years ago, I started teaching because I saw you on a VHS tape. That is very, it's touching, man. It's really moving. And it's, and I, I can say that even because I don't even think I could feel, I could take full credit of that. There's part of that is intangible, but, um, uh, I think um, um, I, I will say that hip hop raised me, you know, like I, I, I fell in love with hip hop around the age of 12 or so. And my brother and I discovered music together and we were up in Canada with, you know, just a sort of arm's length removed from New York and the American cities. Mm. And we were students of the game and we were also aware that we're white Jewish middle class kids embracing a black art form, uh, mm. black culture, and that there is a way to participate in it, and it's a and it's in a respectful way, and it's mm. a way that understands sure. that there's a whole lineage that's way bigger than any of our For sure. own lives that gave birth to this. But if you mm. come into it, yeah, in, in a respectful way, and you try to you know, flip it and add your own twist to it, people will welcome that. And that's what we that's, both Do you think that's gone to... now, though? Do you think that, do you think that well, essence, that attitude's gone now with, with the way I, I, the world ex- takes and re- approaches hip-hop? It's interesting. It, it, I think some of that is gone. I think, you know, as much as I really try to not be one of those shit ain't the same kind of guys because them old heads <laughs> yeah because i i i don't yeah. want to have any type of bitterness in my heart and i don't want to have any kind of like these kids don't get it kind of feeling in my heart I, there's not there's very little positive that comes out of having those feelings in you for, for, so sure, I, for sure you know what i mean so i, I really yeah. make a, a, a an effort to steer clear of those thoughts but i have to say that i can also see that the, the the sort of moral code, the ethics that I embraced yeah. as a teen with hip hop. I mean, you know, I, I see, you know, there's even what's behind you in the room as we talk, you know, like stuff that uh-huh. you grew up with graffiti also. I never wrote myself, but my brother did. Mm-hmm. And we hung out, I hung out with graffiti crews and these ideas of just like, you ride for your crew, you can't be a toy, yeah. you know, you don't bite. And, and you just go out there and try to catch wreck in a way that's as original as possible. Mm. And um, there's a sort of, that's, that's an honor system. For and sure. I don't think that that exists in the same way. And so it makes me think of a few things where like, it's sort of like the good and bad of hip hop becoming as big as it got, you know? And I experienced mm. something similar when DJing when EDM became a thing 10 years ago and DJing became bigger than it ever was. Yeah. Both of those things make me the, lead me to a very simple thought, which is be careful what you wish for. Cause when, when you sure. grow up in, and, and in a sense, like you, yeah, like you grow up in an underground scene and you wish for legitimacy, you know, yeah when we were young and scratching and people would say, well, DJing is not real music and hip hop would get snubbed at award shows and in the institutions, Mm -hmm. but also like for in the, in the sort of like 
grants and like museums and shit like that. Like nothing was being respected. So Mm. you grow up in those times and you think, man, I hope that one day they give us our respect. And I hope one day they put us on the big stage of that festival where the rock Mm. band is. Mm. And the thing is when that happens, other things change. Like, you know, like history is complicated. Evolution's complicated. When things get that big, the pureness changes too. And I think I've had to make peace with the fact that that's just, that's the way shit goes. And it's okay in the sense that there's good that comes with that too. Um, Yeah, for sure. But it's important, I think, to be, I had to get, you know, I sort of like, for years and years, I refused to say anything back, anything bad about the newer generations. I would just say, no, we got to champion the youth and we got to embrace the changes and, you know, you don't want to be the old head that says, oh, well, this, you know, this isn't as good as, as pure as when I was a kid. There's a point where I have to (laughs) say, well, I can champion the newer generations, but I still have to admit that in the heart of this hip hop shit, when it gets this big, I have to admit that, you know, that sort of honor system is not yeah. really there anymore. And yeah. it kind of is what it is. And then you figure out how to like, you know, you kind of figure out how to compose with that, how to how to organize sort of your life around that too. But because it but it's true. The heart's not the same. The 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 code of it honor is not the same. Yeah. And again because it's just you, gotten so big and it's so yeah. easy for anyone to have an enormous record in um overnight. And you know when that when you're playing with power that's that big. It's, it's just too big. A, a lot, yeah. you know, greed yeah. comes in, certain things change and, you know. Other but businessmen good, the, come in, other bigger things come in yeah, and, they, and, sure, and you're, sure. you're saying yes to things you would not, would have said no at your 21-year-old. It's, that, for it's sure. like that. And, 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 yeah. and there's still ways to do things in a, you know, in an honorable way. And there's still part of the the youth that is doing things in a way that is um, honorable. Yeah. You know, like there's plenty of, of kids that yeah, have right. even more curiosity that because pro- here's the thing, when I was 14 studying hip hop, I wouldn't even allow myself to listen to other kinds of music because I was hip hop and that was my life. And I'm to telling see someone you, man. Who's, you know what I mean? Like to see the yeah. open mindedness of people now is great. So there's definitely positives to it. And it's also being the age that you were, that still resonates with kids that were are your age, were your age back then. Kids that are, uh, of a young age, they still are curious as well. So, yeah, I'm often surprised by how much they do know about '90s hip hop or '80s, the things that we grew up on that we weren't even around when they were at their prime. You know, they're still yeah. interested. Yeah, exactly. So it's a funny thing. It is a funny thing the way it goes down. Um, Going back to the DJ thing, uh, of its time especially, uh, you know, I remember when you, you and the Allies got together. I remember mm. when that DMC went down in New York. I, I was there. Mm. Which is, bro, right, I, right. I think every, most of the Scratch perverts came back and said, well, we're going to have to check the video. Because we all saw what you did. You know what I mean? Even as yeah. competitors. That, that, that was, uh, that, yeah, that, that was, that was probably the most heated battle yeah. that I've been a part of. And I don't want to say, I don't mean that to say that there was no animosity towards the Scratch Perverts at all. You know, you remember we were all friends, all but friends. the Allies versus Perverts in 99, I just think that both crews were at the height of Rockstar. Both yeah, I mean, it was just, I mean, but, and you think about it now and compared to where DJing now it was, is now, it was, it was relatively small, but yeah. within that ecosystem of those years and oh, knowing how much turntablism was progressing year after year, it felt yeah. like that was sort of the culminating point of like innovation and battle DJing yeah. and both crews were just coming at it on some like different, level, different direct. And this is yeah. the thing. And I spoke to crazy about this, right? Yeah. I think when you come back with the VHS and you plonk it on and you watch you guys do what you did, it does. I think I felt personally like I was like, yo, these guys took it. I think they took it to the limit. 
like you guys really, really, really thought this shit through. Mm. And it didn't resonate. It, it, well, it did to a, to, to a great extent, but not to that tipping point because, you know, perverts were very crowd responsive and it was all very kind of jovial and British. But, mm-hmm. but you guys really went deep and I was like, yo, the people, I don't think they looked close enough at the camera what was going on. They were struck, they were starstruck that all three of you were on stage. They weren't looking at No, but, you, but also you, you remember what it was like that night. So, you know, for, you know, by the way, if there's viewers who don't know what we're talking about, in 1999, was, I don't know who's watching this or listening to this. Trust in me, 1999, heads, trust me. okay. Well, I was part of a crew called the Allies. That's yes, um, yeah. And there was a t- DMC team battle. Yeah. Where uh, there was plenty of other people in the battle, by the way. But let's be fair; it was between yeah. the Allies and the Scratch Perverts. Yeah. And we, you know, with the Allies, we came with a routine that we felt was gonna win this thing. And the thing that certain people um, don't always realize also is there's circumstances beyond the routine itself. Um, That event was running late. I don't know if you remember that. It was running over time. The DNC organizers were stressing about, like with with venues, if you go past your curfew, you get charged crazy extra money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's all this pressure to because the event was running over time. We went on really late. There was sound problems during our set. The sound wasn't quite loud, maybe because it was over time. Yeah, so sure. we had this routine that was really technical and avant-garde, but also you know, a legit battle routine, we thought we won it. But mm. we also, there's something about the, you know, the time slot that we had and whatever was going on with the sound system, it didn't quite connect when you were there in person that night. The way that, as you said, when you watch in the VH, VHS tape, it, it the way that we thought it should have, yeah. the scratch perverts, this the hell, this me really harsh, the, you know, with the baby sample <laughs> and all this stuff. And, oh uh, and and they and they want and oh and to add another complication there was something very unusual that happened that night where because of the overtime thing they weren't able to tally yeah. up the judges counts that That's night right. so it was a two night event right and they said okay we need to wrap up we're going to announce the winners tomorrow mm-hmm. and um, there was even some behind the scenes stuff where during that. The day going into the second night, some we knew some of the judges and one or two people sort of like whispered to us and said, like, yeah, you guys got it. And then we it got to that second night and they announced the scratch perverts as a winner. Yeah. It was really a heated battle. And yeah. um yeah. but you know, again with crazy. the hindsight, yeah, it was crazy. And and crazy. and you know, the following year, Craze and I went to London to right. get our glory back and, and, and we beat the scratch perverts on their home yeah. turf. So that yeah, revenge yeah, yeah. felt great. <laughs> but it, 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 it really was the culminating point of years and years of battling where, mm. you know, um, there was a, you know, a couple people pushing the artwork for, uh, forward and it felt like that was like the height of it. Um, yeah, yeah. It was like, that yeah. was like the eye of the storm. That was like, yeah, it we're felt like everything sun. was going to boil down, and there was kind of an anticlimactic element to that New York 1999 battle, because mm-hmm. no one could foresee that an event was going to go over time. No one could foresee that there was going to be some weird sound system shit where we're just like, "Hey, is this yeah. us or is this like not loud? What's going on?" Mm-hmm. Like, we knew our routine in and out. We knew how to deliver it tight. We go on stage, we do it, and we're just like. What? Why does this feel different? What's going on? And everyone's like, "We got to wrap up. We got to da da da. We'll be back tomorrow." And we're just like, "Did we win? Did we not win?" Oh, but, must be a, that, you must have been on the edge. I mean, that is just a ooh, that would. But you know me. what, man? <laughs> um, I've been, you know, since then. That was, you know, twenty-one years ago. Since yeah, then, for sure. been, you know, I've been DJing for twenty plus years. It's yeah. things like that that trains my nerves for anything we're literally i mean man i've been i've performed at huge festivals in front of like thirty thousand people where like you know then you fast forward to the serato age where like my laptop crashed 
in yeah, front yeah. of huge Open stages or I've had things like that, you know, cause in the meantime, you get into like the technological age. So now we have to deal with hard drives and shit like that. Mm. I've had terrifying things happen on stage where I'm just like, it's fine. I got this. What is it? Yeah. One minute of dead time, two minutes. Let me grab this mic, even though I suck on the mic and I'll just be like, yo guys hanging in there, you know, yeah, give me a yeah, sec. Yeah, I gotta yeah. do this. Da, da, da. You guys ready? Boom. You go back on and, and, you know, you just kind of learn that, like, yeah, you need to learn a beatbox, brother. You know, the beatbox. You know what? Maybe you're right. That that would probably <laughs> help me out. But in general, you just kind of you you figure out that like nothing's insurmountable, and even if something you know kicks you down and you you land on your ass on stage, you're just like, I can, you this. know, I'll, yeah, I can, yeah, I there's you know. <laughs> There's nothing I haven't gotten back up from, so let's just keep it going. And then you just keep it going. I love that. I love that. And your relationship with Craze has become like, you know, the the Bert and Ernie of hip hop. That's my guy. That's yeah, I'm telling you, man. Like, yeah. <laughs> it, and, and, it, it's yeah, beautiful. Ahead, it's beautiful. No, I like, you know, thanks, it's the, the bromance I think every DJ wants, you know what I mean? I mean, but the thing with that too is we've both gone on our own journey for years and years, you know? And sometimes I don't see him for a year. Nowadays we see each other a little bit more frequently, but like when I was in the full swing of fool's gold and remixes and EDM festivals and stuff, and he was much more just in the sort of beat scene. um, Mm. We always had love for each other. We would talk, you know, couple times a year at least but sometimes we wouldn't actually see each other for a while because we were just kind of in different scenes Mm. and but through time everything has sort of joined back um closer together to now where we definitely see each other at least a few times a year and and talk way more regularly um but you know even with that like look when we formed the allies there was like a plan to each go and dominate you know, and, and there were certain battles, like he would enter a battle, I would enter another battle. And it would be For like, sure. you go dominate there, I'll go dominate here. Like and Genesis sense, or Wu-Tang or something, right? It's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, you know, in the, in the 20 years since then, as we've both had to navigate a cutthroat industry, because, you know, the music business is not easy. And we yeah. both had to sort of like go through ups and downs and figure shit out. I think we both have this love for each other fundamentally where we're like, you know, you went over there. I went over here. I love watching what you're doing. Hopefully he loves watching what I'm doing. Mm. And, and we we're both just like fans of each other at heart. And yeah. when we get back together, it's so easy for us to kind of just do anything. And it's, so it's fun yeah. to just go through all that. And also just to like watch each other go through life shit too. Like I'm watching, mm. You know, when when his daughter turned eighteen, like that was very moving for me. I'm like, yeah, I remember. Like his daughter was born right around when the, that New York '99 battle was going on. Totally, you know? yeah. She turned twenty one this year, I think. So I know, it's that like, shit is crazy. <laughs> yeah, so so just on some life shit to be like, man, yeah. these are milestones, um, and you know, we can bond all day over how to freak this or that piece of equipment. But also, mm. we, you know, it's nice to just be happy for each other as humans, yeah. that, you know, that grow, that fig, you know, that figure out how to age yeah. in this shit too. Like it's for it's sure. it's deeper than a crab scratch. <laughs> <laughs> it's deeper than a, that's the quote. That's the t-shirt right there. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, crazy is my boy, man. Like the the, yeah. the the things that I mean, he's and curiously, actually, what what did you think? Because he pulled off this mix, you know, kind of going on it like at uh, EDM DJs who don't DJ, uh, you know, mm-hmm. you're of a class where you were in the fraternity, but you, you had more, you know, ammo, more gear, more technical abilities than not that I'm actually, let me retract. Cause I'm not one to judge, but it felt like to me that th- what his, his DJ skills displayed in that thing was a message. How did that resonate from, how did that resonate to you who was in that, in the, the, that fraternity at the time? Um, I, I agree with him. And, you know, I'm, I'm always down to shake things up too. And, and um, 
Yeah, there was a point in time when when EDM got so big, you know, sometimes we would compare it to hair metal and just be like, yo, this is just like some stadium <laughs> shit, you know, because yeah. some stadium shit where, you know, everyone's just got like the fan blowing their hair and, and yeah. uh, you know, like the biggest stage production you could imagine. Yeah. And the thing is, I can appreciate that side of it too. You know, you need it. You and need it in a genre. You, you, I think and, you need to take it there. Yeah, and also like, I I like theatrics, and I, I I can appreciate a good show. So I would be, you know, I opened for Swedish House Mafia at a bunch of shows. Mm. Um, I'm friendly with David Guetta and, and a lot of those artists. Um, so when when there would be a controversy of like there would be some sort of video, I remember there was like footage of. Steve Angelo doing something and so you know there's a video of something where people like oh he's not even really mixing this thing live mm. and he would come back and say yeah because I have a pyro and lights and all this stuff that's timed that's attached to a time code and this is the best way to, to put on a good show mm. <clears throat> my thing is I would look at that and say and I've seen to use this example, Steve Angelo DJ at clubs too, where he's a hell of a DJ. So I'd mm -hmm. be like, look, this guy's a le legit DJ, but when he's doing the biggest of the big stage of a festival, and he also wants to put on a spectacle. Yeah. He doesn't, do you really need to be beat matching this thing to, to, to you know, this song, yeah. to that song? No, you can do a little mega mix pre prefabricated thing and put on a great show and just put on the theatrics because when you're on that stage in front of 80,000 people, that's what works. I can appreciate that. But then Craze can come in and be like, yo, all these guys doing hearts with their hands and doing some fake love shit. Fuck that. You need skills. I can appreciate that too. So I just mm -hmm. love seeing all the different sides of it. And I just because the thing is, all of that is a conversation. And then exactly. what's, what's going to come out of that conversation? Yeah. Um, and so, yes, some of that, some of that, you know, main stage stuff became kind of a farce. And mm. I was right next to it and I'd be like, yo, this, this is too much. But mm. there would always be someone doing it in a way that's cool. And yeah. if anything, I would watch some of those bigger shows and think, hmm, okay, what, is there anything I can learn from this? Take away from that. Into exactly. my, yeah. Can I put that yeah. into my show? Because I'm not trying to just do the same show as 10 years ago either. So mm what's you know what can we take from each other and push this thing forward that's interesting you say that it is a conversation it's like it's like nirvana being the answer to the hair metal of that of the day completely completely you have to have those debates it has to ha mm -hmm. and it has to come to the forefront or else you really aren't you aren't uh, developing as a genre as as yeah, as creatives like you say you take elements of all those things right mm -hmm. and and yeah. when and, and when nirvana was going on a whole bunch of band, bands got lumped under the name grunge. And then mm -hmm. you, and I remember when certain bands would say, we're not grunge, the same way that when EDM blew up, a lot of DJs would just be tweeting, well, don't call me EDM. Yeah. The thing is from when you take a couple steps back, that's just the way shit goes for any scene, right? And through yeah. time, certain things transpire. So back in the Nirvana days, maybe Pearl Jam was saying, we're not really the same genre as Nirvana. So why are you guys calling us grunge? And for a couple of years, people were like, look, it's all grunge. It's fine. Just deal with it. But then years later, Pearl Jam were able to do their own thing and be like, mm -hmm. they're a jam band really. So they, you know, but you, people only saw that 10 years later. So the same way with um, what was going on with DJing for a couple of years, it was just, everything was changing really fast people put one label on the whole thing yeah. and then you know time has a natural way of of sifting through things and yeah. through the you know through the natural fil filter of time and you know later on certain artists emerge out of that whole storm and they end up doing the thing that is more specific to them That's you know because right. if you look at you know what i mean and then yeah um um, well, you're a great example because sure. through all the intensity and the seriousness of, of EDM and, you know, the pyrotechnics and whatever, you, the Duck Sauce stuff just felt like a kind of a respite 
it, and it was interesting. Oh, man, the, that sauce was meant to be practically punk in in that setting, <laughs> yeah, and we didn't want to play complete the game. opposite to what people are doing. Yeah. You know, <laughs> we were just we were just making fun of everything, and mm. and we were doing you know making ridiculous songs and and making funny videos and and you know we had a giant inflatable duck on stage. I mean, it's the whole thing was. <laughs> Was, it was spinal tap, bro. <laughs> yeah, but it was like done in a way that was also kind of Cypress Hill, Beastie yeah, Boys, you totally. know, just kind of like just having fun with it and just going back to the very raw art of finding great loops, digging for samples. Yeah. Duck Sauce has always been really fun for me because it's one half extremely pure because there's nothing realer than digging for records. So one I mean, half the extremely, yeah. One half extremely pure, and one and another half total comedy, like yeah. Monty Python, National Lampoon, like total ridiculousness, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at the yeah, same time, that. like that. But at the same time, Fat Boy Slim did it that way too. You and and that's mean? a great example. That's a real. That's a close comparable, I think, of its time, for sure. For sure, and we were always aware of that. And when you know, so Barbara Streisand became the biggest record in the world right when EDM was starting to happen. So all these big labels wanted to sign us and we were literally that was such a us, big tune, bro. Like you can't even say that word without me worrying about getting copyright claim on the fucking YouTube video. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's crazy. But it, it, people didn't realize that like literally the labels that wanted to sign us were also signing Alesso and Avicii and those kinds of artists. And I'm mm. not, nothing disrespectful. I, Honestly, love a lot of these these guys' music, and rest yeah. in peace to Avicii. But day. we would just say like, you can't really put us in the same category as that, just because we're in the same chart. And we went yeah. and made more records, and I think we kind of confused the record industry after after a For while. Sure. They were like, "Well, you know, what, what are you doing? Uh, yeah, and, and <laughs> where's the other number one record?" And and we were just saying like, "Look, we're making whatever the hell we want." And maybe, you know, some of these records will be bigger than others. But duck, we always had a, an understanding for ourselves of what Duck Sauce always was, which is mm. just some record digger shit. Like, yeah. to us, Duck Sauce was more similar to Cold Cut meets the first De La Soul album Fire. than whoever, was, whoever our contemporary was, contemporaries were at that point in time in the charts. So Man, that's a, you, you know what I mean? Like that's that's, deep, that's the spirit yeah. that that we that we took, and mm. um, and we would just throw these curveballs, and some of the, yeah, some of the records, you know, one or, one or two records did very well, a couple yeah. records did kind of well, a couple records didn't connect at all, and we were just like, who cares? Like we're having fun, and yeah. um, but yeah. that was always our thing. It's definitely that that sort of cold cut. Fat Boy Slim mentality of like this is some record digging shit, but it's also weird curveballs, and let's just see what happens. That's interesting you say that because when I listen to when I listen to you break down the uh, the, the components of um, what makes Duck Sauce great now, when I mm. now when you say that, I'm like, yeah, of course it is. How much you on some business shit? How much mm-hmm. of a strategy do you put? Because a track, yeah, you know I mean, like. Your business, you do the business. You the mm-hmm. things that you do, you commit with. You see them right until they're done. Now, that takes a lot of discipline, a lot of faith, and a lot of structure. Like, how yeah. much of the projects that you do, how how deep do you go into the structure of defining? In a great example, being the stuck source here, how far down the road do you define it? How how you know what I'm saying? Um, I think a, a, a lot of times what happens with me is a project sort of. There's an initial idea, and then some of it also takes form along the way. And right. then there's a point where it becomes fleshed out, and I continue it. So, you know, but even when I start something, I remember when Armand and I started Duck Sauce in 2009, or this past year when, I, when my brother and I started to do the Brothers Maklovich. Mm. I, I need to have a, a, an idea of what makes that project different from other things that I do just so I know creatively where to go with my inspiration is that the and then there's all, maybe or I don't know it's just but it's mm. also the music fa- I don't know music fan producer yeah and you know you want the best gro- yeah no but like growing up studying Prince Paul 
what Prince mm-hmm. Paul did with Grave Diggers, and then what yeah. he did with De La Soul, but then what he did with his weird psychoanalysis record, and what he did with Handsome Boy Modeling School, and what he did with Chris Rock. Those are um, all different concepts. That's crazy you know? when you think about that as a pedigree. Bro, Ooh. it's it, yeah, it's incredible. And 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 even when he was a teenager in Stets of Sonic, each one of those projects had yeah. a sonic identity and aesthetic. And as a fan, I could I could eat those things up and and just appreciate them and listen yeah. to the Handsome Boy Ooh. record next to Balloon Mind State and be like, oh, I get how these are related, but I also love how each one is fleshed out differently. So you know, that's the way I approach a lot of my projects. So it's, to me, it's, it's art first and business second. So I'll start with that process of like, okay, cool. What's, I'm doing something um, with this collaborator. How, how am I, like, what, what, what are my paintbrushes? What are my, you know, what outfit am I wearing <laughs> for that thing? Like, what's, for what real? does this thing yeah. look and feel like? And then inevitably, in the first year or two, there's naturally a few more, changes that happen where it just grows into a real life thing, you yeah. know, and then you just sort of like yeah. continue running with that. But I love that aspect of it. And then, so to go back to your question, then I figure out on a business level, what's the best way to execute that. Got you. Do you feel yeah. like sometimes, the, yeah, absolutely. I'll get you. Do you feel like sometimes, uh, do you, do you delegate? Do you give, do you give people the, do they have to wholeheartedly understand the project? You know, if you've got a, team in place with that you know how how much delegating do you give to them and how much input do you well, allow um i definitely i definitely like spell out the way that i envision each project but i also understand that at the end of the day like say if, if you're talking about like my management for sure. They'll, yeah, I'll don't. tell them if I start a new project, I'll say, Hey, I got this new thing. I'm excited about it. And it's, it's kind of this vibe, like this meets that. But I don't also don't expect them to fully get it until I create proof of proof of concept. Cause mm. I'm always going to understand something from this sort of guts of it from the inside mm. a little bit before other people get it from the outside. So I'll explain it and I'll say kind of, what you know how i want to approach it and maybe like what you know what's the first show or what's you know what what are some looks we want to go after but Mm. um it's kind of on me to prove that it makes sense for the first little while you know what i mean so if anything i have my like i have a, a bit of a creative team and a lot of it is just like me my brother and catch dubs my partner at fool's gold the three of us are kind of the brain trust. And you and bounce we, ideas around yeah. a coffee or whatnot. Yep. yep. So the three of us will shape a lot of the things that I do. And then in order for like my management and my booking agent to really see what we see, sometimes mm-hmm. there's a little bit of a time lapse. And it's that's not knocking them, but I feel like we'll get something on the intention side and then I have to sort of like make it real. And then, and then everyone kind of gets it more. Yeah. And then, and through that, that journey of uh, them finding it and molding it to, well, essentially having the coordinates from you. And like mm-hmm. you say, that time lapse that so you, that they, they find their feet with it themselves. I guess that's the extra 20% to your hundred that you, de- you give to them people and let them own it and run with it and f- get a feel for it. But yeah. without those ingredients that you have in the first place, there is no story. There is no, you've got to have a well-structured idea. Yeah. And, and, um, and then there's a point where management and the agents fully embrace the identity of a project and they'll go and get certain business opportunities or shows or whatever that I might not even think of myself, you know? So mm-hmm. then, then something is fully a machine. That's interesting. How much, yeah. how much give do you allow for, say, for instance, you know, it, it, an extreme being Daft Punk where that every, mm-hmm. you know, everything has to be right. You know, everything time-wise, set-wise, lights-wise, everything has to be spot on. Skrillex is another good example of that. Sure. Yeah. Um, and you feel like you have to kind of, you know, you have to kind of bend a little bit to an idea because, you know, yeah. you, 
you're a risk taker, you're an idea maker. And when you throw these things out, you are pushing creative boundaries to what people know you as in some generations or expect from you from a, from a more current place. Mm. How much of that do you allow? How much do you allow people's expectations and you, you feel you have to bend to a certain demographic or stage? Um, I might allow a little bit more than your examples of Daft Punk and Skrillex, but compared to a lot of other artists, I don't bend much. <laughs> yeah, I kind of think... I'm gonna. I'm definitely more on that side of things of your the of your examples than than a lot of other DJs and artists. Um, you do have to fight for your you have to fight yeah. for your project, right? That's yeah, just... yeah, but uh, yeah, and also just um, I've just like creating a, a, a distinct identity for a project and being very thorough about every piece of what people see mm. is something that I've seen the rewards of that many times yeah. through the years. So there, like, you're right. There is a part where you sort of have to fight for your, um, your sort of like, sandbox to play in and just sit, be like no don't 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 make you know don't make my box smaller don't don't you know yeah. like you allow me to flesh this out the way that i see it you do have to fight in the beginning um and sometimes people bring on certain opportunities or business things and dangle a carrot in front of you and you're like man yeah do i take this or not but but um <laughs> You know, like just people had that though. That's yeah, that's for a, sure, for sure. Yeah, we definitely mm. have. And uh, but but I, I I stay pretty firm about the way I want things to be presented. Did you did you see that with Kanye? Like touring with Kanye and being around Kanye, he yeah yeah for sure for sure. Working with like and yeah, I worked with Kanye a long time ago, man. Like two thousand four to two thousand eight, like. We're in 2020. That shit was a long time ago. For sure. But even sure. then, even then in those early years, I saw him fight for his vision on a lot of things. Um, and, you know, walk into establishments where everyone would just sort of, like if, if you want to do things a certain way and people say no, a lot of artists will just say, Okay, I understand. Let me see how else I can do it. He would just not take no for an answer oh, so many I times. I can imagine. You know, and now people celebrate him. We're, we're going to not get into the political stuff, but no, aside no, no, no. from the political, right? Just in yeah. general, as far as his legacy as an artist and, and, and visionary, people are like, oh, Kanye changed the game. It took a lot of fighting, man. It took a lot of yeah. fighting and a lot of like headbutting and a lot of not taking no um for for that for those changes to happen and for that impact to be felt and yeah mm -hmm. i definitely i definitely saw um i witnessed that firsthand and i i, I saw the positive the uh, positive mm -hmm. of that where you're you know he changed the game the game doesn't like to get changed the game yeah. as an industry prefers to run on autopilot yeah they like old money to stay old money with old people yeah. you know that's just the deal people yeah. don't like change industry don't like change i get it no they, they'd rather just kind of do the thing that they did for years and years mm, for sure yeah. and it's not that time anymore you gotta yeah. go with it yeah yeah you gotta fight you gotta fight on mm -hmm. um so what's the future, my brother? We have come full circle. We are back to the start again. What is the future? Well, <laughs> I mean, look, shout out to everybody in the UK too, because I, I've seen, you know, in the news and on Twitter and things like that, I've seen a lot of the challenges that the music scene and music industry have faced specifically in the UK mm. in the last couple of months. And, and, you know, my heart is with you guys because, you know, when it comes to a certain lack of, of funds from, you know, the government and lack of support for venues and that whole mm. thing. And even just like on the morale level, hearing certain members of parliament talk about music and the arts in a way that's so dismissive. Yeah, you heard it. it yeah. Man, I, I really feel for that. And, and it, it hurt. It even hurts me. And I'm not mm. over there. 
but it hurts my heart to hear that. So I just want to get that out there. And so what's in the future? I mean, I think there's, there's a, there's a hope to rebuild because the, you know, there's damage from this year that's going to be felt unfortunately for many years, but for many years, I, yeah. I do have hope that, that, um, you know, there's, there's a passion and there's heart that's going to rebuild things from here on out. And that in the big picture, things will be okay for musicians on, on both sides of, of the pond. But, um, yeah. so as far you know, if you ask me what's in the future, this is the most uncertain year that we've ever lived through. Mm. I, you know, I don't even know what's in the future, yeah. but I, I, on my side, I've already started planting a lot of seeds for certain things that I want to build in the coming years. Who knows what's going to come out of that, what's mm. going to work and what's not going to work. But right now, I think it's just getting through this shit, getting through this year. Yeah. Yeah. figuring out the way forward and hopefully you know coming out of this with a few lessons um mm. and and having a hand in shaping what the next chapter is going to look like um because you know as we know everything is upside down right now so crazy you know i know what's important to me in my heart i, I know there's a lot of there's people that i share passions with and share values with mm. and i'm you know i'm I'm trying to, um, I'm trying to play some sort of role in um, in how we get out of this. But you know, I'm also just trying to figure shit out for myself. And there's days where yeah. there's days that feel hopeless, but there's days that feel hopeful. And um, yeah, that's kind of where my head's at. Yeah, man. <laughs> Every, keep your head, and keep your head down. down. Yeah. Yeah. And there's certain days where it's just like, you know what? I'm just gonna go scratch for a couple hours which is something that i didn't even have time to do for years and years not to mm. not not to say i stopped scratching but i would just kind of like scratch up my shows or scratch when i'm recording a mix or scratch when i'm recording something but days where i would just go and mess around with my turntables with no type of agenda in sight yeah. it's crazy how may, the amount of time that flew by where i di didn't have that sort of like leisure time yeah and it's leisure while the world is burning but it's still leisure time and there's yeah. a, there's a, there's an there's an experimentation that comes with that that i i've been really uh valuing this year you sure. know so and it we'll really see is, what comes it, out of that for sure it's about sharpening your sword now because yeah. everyone's on a level playing field you know sharpen yeah. the axe isn't it yeah let's go because yeah man. exactly like there's an opportunity to draw a new map Exactly. Right? And yeah. and we come from an era where we had to have swords, like you said. Um and so, you know, I think that there's a way to draw a new map where skills are valued, maybe a little more than in the last couple of years, hopefully, because sure. that's something that we all care about. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And bro, yeah. it's just, it's been such a pleasure talking to you because this is my new thing. Do you know what I yeah. mean? And you yeah, know, cool. It's great to have you on the platform. I really appreciate Thank you, man. you coming on, my brother. Awesome. Thank Stay you. on the line for a second. I'm going to see us out. All right, ladies and gentlemen, live from Los Angeles, <laughs> wherever you are, give a round yeah. of applause, a cheer, or a polite clap to the man in the middle. <laughs> on the A track. Thank you so much, my brother. Yeah. Killer Keller podcast. We are like him was that fashion. You stay lucky. Don't don't talk to any strange people. All right. <laughs> Make sure you do it. We are like that. Peace. <laughs>